Hello, everyone. Welcome to ISJIP Live Journal Club for July of 2021. Um, while people are joining, I will work on some introduction material and housekeeping issues. Um, and then we'll get to our presenters for today and the articles that they will be presenting. So um, our topic for this month is germ cell tumors of the ovary and gestational trophoblastic disease. Those were combined due to some earlier months where um, I went and had some special sessions, but I wanted to make sure we at least covered both of these topics within the calendar year. Um, I'm Natalie Benet, I'm your moderator, and today I have a co-moderator, Kyle Devins, who I will introduce in just one moment. I did want to mention that next month, uh, the ISJIP Live Interesting Case Presentation Series will start. This is a format which is moderated by Dr. Jennifer Bennett from the University of Chicago. And it is, like Journal Club, targeted at trainees and early career pathologists. And um, basically, you pick an interesting case and um, present it to uh, the audience like in the similar uh, time um, uh, as, as the journal club presentations about 12 to 15 minutes and you would have a mentor to do that either from your home institution or if you um, are at an institution where you do not have a gynecologic pathologist or someone who would mentor you, um, ISJIP Live will provide one for you. And this starts next month. So keep your um, eye out on isjip.ca and um, look for that. And um, also last month was the first month that we had journal club um, on the alternate time of, in the Eastern Hemisphere with uh, Dr. Karen Talia being the moderator. So she will continue to moderate every other month. So next month's Journal Club, um, Dr. Talia will moderate. So between myself and Dr. Bennett and Dr. Talia, um, if you are a trainee or an early career pathologist, or you have someone um, in your institution who would like to present, please contact us. We would love to hear from you and um, help you in any way that we can. So, oh. Skip to cut. Okay, here's my co-host for today. This is Dr. Kyle Devins. He is a clinical and research fellow with the Department of Pathology at Mass General Hospital in Boston. And um, he has been, uh, he was one of the first trainees, I think back when he was still a resident at Penn. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle. Yeah, um, yeah I think so. And uh, so he's just been involved and he's been helping me to co-moderate and it's been a great experience. So now I will turn the PowerPoint over to Dr. Devins. Thanks so much, Dr. Benet. I appreciate you having me back. I always have a good time when I'm here. <laughs> and now that you've introduced me, I'll introduce our speakers for today. So first off, we're going to have Dr. Maxwell Yang, who's a second year pathology, re pathology resident at the uh, Department of Pathology at the University of Michigan. Next, we have Dr. Randa Magoob, who is a fellow in the Department of Pathology at King Hussein Cancer Center in Amman, Jordan. And then finally, we'll have Dr. Rafiq Shahid. He is a fourth year resident at Brown Hospital in Rhode Island Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. And these are the articles we'll be presenting today. First off, we'll talk about malignant mixed germ cell tumors of the ovary. Second, we'll be discussing somatically derived yolk sac tumor. And I think the first case report actually we've discussed on ISHIP Live. And then our uh, last case will be um, a discussion of ovarian intermediate trophoblastic tumors. And just uh, to go over briefly the learning objectives for Journal Club, uh, Journal Club's held to engage trainees and uh, uh, encourage them to gain scientific knowledge and really assess their ability to critically evaluate um, literature. And we do that in a supportive uh, setting here on SGF Live. And um, our goal is to provide mentorship and try to engage people from all around the world with this conference. Sorry, and Kyle, I'm happy to talk about this because I oh, should sure. shove this in here. <laughs> so basically, the uh, trainees and early career persons who present here use a PowerPoint format to pre prepare their uh, presentations. And these are the questions that they're trying to answer with their um, presentation. So if you would like to take a screenshot of this to follow along with them, that's the only reason I stuck it in here. Thanks, Kyle. Oh, perfect. No problem. All right. Without further ado, we'll get started with uh, Dr. Maxwell Yang. He'll be talking about malignant mixed germ cell tumors of the ovary. And just actually quickly before we start, um, keep in mind that we have a, a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen, which you can use to, to ask any questions. And we'll do our best to get to those after everyone has presented. Thank you, Kyle and Natalie. Um, let me share my PowerPoint. And is this visible to everyone? Yes, looks good. All right, perfect. 
Um, I'll get started then. Uh, welcome everyone, thank you for coming. I'm Maxwell Wong, I'm a pathology PGY2 at the University of Michigan. And today I'll be talking about this paper from Dr. Safdar Stahl and Young of Massachusetts General Hospital called Malignant Mixed Germ Cell Tumors of the Ovary, analysis of 100 cases, emphasizing the frequency and interrelationships of their tumor types. Starting with the background and study design, the topic, of course, are the ovarian malignant mixed germ cell tumors, defined as containing two or more components of primitive germ cell neoplasia. Uh, these entities would be embryonal carcinoma, dysgerminoma, choriocarcinoma, immature teratoma, and yolk sac tumors. And these have been frequently overlooked in the literature compared to their testicular counterparts. And although the clinical manifestations are generally well known, Epidemiologic data, such as frequency of the various components and their intraspecimen histologic patterns, have been relatively sparsely documented. And also, interestingly, embryoid bodies, when present, are usually in close relation to both embryonal carcinoma and yolk sac tumors, thus raising the question if they give rise to both of these tumors. So the aim of the paper was twofold. The first was to detail the frequency of each component and any associations with one another. And the second was to detail the role of embryoid bodies in giving rise to yolk sac tumors and or embryonal carcinoma. So starting with some H&E to refresh ourselves, uh, this is a pretty good picture of a dysgerminoma with the uh, well-defined nuclear borders, prominent nucleoli, and, and uh, pale to eosinophilic cytoplasm. Interestingly, in this picture as well, kind of off-center to the right is a syncytiotrophoblast cell, which can be rarely seen in dysgerminomas. And then frequently they have this alveolar pattern with them with fibrous septae separating nests of tumor cells, frequently with an inflammatory infiltrate of lymphocytes or plasma cells. Moving on to a yolk sac tumor, the most common architectural pattern seen is this reticular microcystic pattern with cells of varying degrees of cytoplasm, but still having a relatively prominent nucleoli and a loose mixoid stroma, uh, typically in the background. Moving on to an embryoid body, it has two general components. One here, this hyperchromatic embryonal carcinoma within a amnion-like sac cavity lined by yolk sac tumor cells. Um, so moving on to methods of the paper, the ovarian germ cell tumor cases were picked from the consultation files of the late Dr. Scully and Dr. Young of Massachusetts General Hospital. And they also included cases with a component of polyembryoma, which are just numerous confluent well-formed embryoid bodies. However, if the tumor was mostly polyembryomas of pure form, they were excluded. Um, there are opinions out there that polyembryomas themselves are a form of malignant mixed germ cell tumor. However, the authors of this paper disagree and therefore they excluded almost pure form polyembryomas from the study. They further subcategorized these three into three patterns of polyembryoma pattern or background. The difference being that the polyembryoma background has embryoid bodies in association with embryonal carcinoma and yolk sac tumors, or just focal embryoid bodies as another pattern they saw. Tumors associated with gonadoblastomas were excluded as typically the underlying ovary is not normal. And then for all these cases, the h &E slides were reviewed and there were a small number with no slides available. So they looked at the original console report and they took note of components that were mentioned. And finally, the relative proportions were semi-quantitatively measured and documented. The results of the paper generally showed that the patients displayed the usual clinical presentation with abdominal pain or distension, and sometimes rarely endocrine presentations such as hirsutism or precocious puberty, and they were vast majority were unilateral at 96%. Uh, and they were generally within the typical age range of well, most commonly 10 to 30 years old. Grossly, 67% of the 77 cases with a gross description were a solid and cystic, while the remaining cases were purely solid. And they frequently saw areas of necrosis and hemorrhage. 
Rarely in five cases were two distinct components identified grossly. And then in order of frequency, the tumor entities were yolk sac tumor at 91%, followed by dysterminoma, immature teratoma, embryonal carcinoma, and choriocarcinoma. The most common combination seen was a dysterminoma and yolk sac tumor at 25% of cases. And the second most common was an immature teratoma and yolk sac tumor at 20%. Embryoid bodies were found in 21 cases, and in 16 of these cases, they had close histologic associations with a yolk sac tumor and or an embryonal carcinoma. These are two tables from the paper. The table on the left showing general combination seen in germ cell neoplasia of the ovary in general. The most frequent germ cell tumor of the ovary is a dermoid cyst or a mature teratoma. And these just show the various combinations that can be seen. And on the right is the paper from the study with the results of the different combinations they saw. At the top is our dysterminoma and yolk sac tumor, followed by our immature teratoma, yolk sac, and the various combinations that follows. Interestingly, some tumors had all five components seen within them. Uh, for some gross pictures, on the left here, we have one of the cases where two entities can be seen uh, distinctly on gross. The outer periphery is more solid, lobulated in appearance, kind of reminiscent of a dysterminoma with a more variegated centered, consistent with a yolk sac tumor. And on the right is a solid cystic specimen that contain all five uh, components of primitive germ cell neoplasia. On the left is a microscopic view of a dysterminoma on the bottom left and a yolk sac tumor on the top right combo separated by a fibrous band. Microscopically, about 88% of the cases with this combination seen were distinctly separated by this fibrous band, but a few were admixed with each other. And on the right, we have a embryonal carcinoma and yolk sac tumor combination. However, this one shows in the center fragmented embryoid bodies, showing that kind of close relation that these bodies have with these two entities. Following on the left here, we have an immature teratoma kind of at the top right area with scattered foci of yolk sac tumors. And then on the right here, we have these kind of glandular tubular structures that were difficult to ascertain the origin from, but this will be discussed in my next slide. So for the discussion of the paper, they analyzed 100 cases and it generally supported the epidemiological data that we have on MMGCTs of the ovary that they would commonly recur, oh, sorry, occur in the first six decades of life and they account for roughly 15% of all primitive germ cell neoplasms. They also noticed several differences uh, from MMGCTs of the testes and found that in the testes is generally older age of presentation, 28 years old for embryonal carcinoma predominant and 33 year old for seminoma predominance, which is a testicular counterpart to the dysterminoma of the ovary. Embryonal carcinomas in the testes are by far the most common at over 90%. However, in females is only about 38%. And the most com common combination of in the testes was embryonal carcinoma and immature teratoma, which interestingly was not seen in any of the 100 cases of this paper. Uh, the paper also reiterated the usefulness of immunohistochemistry in differentiating neoplastic components and admixed tumors or uh, glands that the cell of origin could not be easily identified. They suggested a panel of OCT4, pancytokeratin, glipcan 3 or CD117 or D240. And interestingly, in 10 cases, they also had an additional presence of PNET, rhabdomyosarcoma, or high-grade undifferentiated sarcoma. However, these did not seem to have any associations with the other primitive germ cell neoplasms. So for the strengths of the paper, I thought it was really thorough documentation of each component, including a gross description, and even whether the components are admixed or separate. They, I also thought that the presence of embryo bodies and their relation to the embryonal carcinomas or yolk sac tumors were well documented as well, including some pictures that we saw before. Um, further questions for the paper. I, also, I would like to maybe have them elaborate more on the potential clinical applications of the study. 
it was it more so for academic interest and categorization or perhaps is there a way we can apply this study to for clinical treatment and i had questions regarding how components are measured so on average these specimens were 16 centimeters in size and to very to sample the entire specimen would be very difficult and since percentages could vary based on region sampled did the authors have any suggestions perhaps on different grossing protocols to best sample and represent a specimen and so for example would the finding have malignant mixed germ cell tumors increase with increased sampling and then were there any disagreements between the original diagnosis and on review for the study i back i'm not sure how far the cases would go back for the consultation files however i do know that ihc has been more in use as time goes on so i was curious if there were any disagreements between the two and if ihc was used for those disagreements a uh, potential clinical application i thought of was perhaps as the author suggests in the paper that the different components should be documented. And there has been a paper published in 2005 saying that among the germ cell malignancies, those with dysterminomas or immature teratomas did have good chemotherapy outcomes in relation to the other tumors. So perhaps by thorough documentation of the different components, you could direct chemotherapy treatments and or prognosis. And then also, since it's difficult to grossly differentiate between the two entities, it's important to adequately sample the specimen. Um, that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. And thought I'd end on a nice note. And these are my pets that I've had in my life, my two cats and my dog. Your, your dog who just recently graduated, it looks like. So <laughs> yeah, that was from when I graduated <laughs> med school. <Okay. laughs> that, was really, that was really well done. Good job. Kyle, did you want to say anything before we launch the polling questions? Thanks, Dr. Wong. No, just thank you. It was a nice overview of the paper, a nice personal touch at the end. And yeah, now we can move on to the uh, the polling question in the interest of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's just a matter of me working the controls. So you have to stop. <laughs> right, there we go. All good. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Well, the poll awesome. should have popped up in the um, screen for you if you're in the audience. And so, if you're not in the audience, uh, if you're watching this on video, here are the questions. Awesome. Yes, and this is interactive, so feel free to pick a choice. We can't tell who picked it, so <laughs> there's no worries about participating. Yeah. And we'll wait a few uh, seconds here to try to get everyone to respond. Some of the questions are a little longer to read. Uh, and in fact, I can kind of highlight them. So, so the first question um, refers to the uh, most common uh, component of the mixed germ cell tumors in the study, whether it be yolk sac tumor, immature teratoma, embryonal carcinoma, or dysterminoma. And the second question um, refers to uh, the polyembryoma. Uh, background, um, which, as Dr. Wong mentioned, the, the authors deal with slightly differently than others in the literature and uh, asks how the authors classify the embryoid body in these. It looks like we're getting quite a few responses. Yeah, we, we give are. It maybe, what do you think, 10 more seconds? Yeah, not long. A few seconds. We'll... Sounds good. Okay, get your answers in. I'm going to end the polling. We will get to see the results. So everyone should be able to see the results now. Awesome. OK, great. So yeah, yolk sac tumor was the most common component. I think the most common combination they saw was yolk sac tumor and dysterminoma, followed by yolk sac tumor and immature teratoma. But overall, yolk sac tumor was the most common component, um, which again is unlike the malignant mixed germ cell counterpart in the male and the testis. Um, and then for the second question, um, the authors uh, talk about um, seeing the background of polyembryoma in a significant um, subset of their tumors, um, which is basically numerous um, embryoid bodies uh, that are sort of nodular and spaced apart. And the embryoid body was illustrated uh, by Dr. Wong. It consists of an inner lining of um, 
cells that would be consistent with an embryonal carcinoma, and then uh, the yolk sac tumor sort of epithelium along the outside. And many papers uh, refer to this as a malignant mixed germ cell tumor, which is what most people uh, selected here. But actually, the authors of this study propose, um, and actually a, a previous paper, I believe, that perhaps it's actually a component of immature teratoma recapitulating about week 13 of embryonal development. Um, so, you know, I don't know what the correct answer is, and I think it's somewhat philosophical, um, but just bringing up the point that uh, the authors, unless there was an overgrowth of either the yolk sac tumor or uh, embryonal carcinoma component associated with those um, embryoid bodies, they wouldn't actually classify the polyembryoma itself as a malignant mixed germ cell tumor. So just sort of an interesting point. Okay. All right. All right, thanks. So we'll, we do have a couple of questions and we'll try to get to those at the end, but we're gonna give our presenters time to present and then we'll have a discussion at the end. So I'm going to stop the polling results and um, now, yeah, so next we'll have Dr. Magoo, who will be discussing um, somatically derived yolk sac tumors of the ovary. Dr. Magoo, you're muted, so feel free to unmute. And Hello. Yes. Yes. And we can only see your eyes. If you can angle your camera down, we'd be able to see more of your face. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Great. Uh, okay. So, um, do you want to put it in present? Hello. Um, yes. Um, uh, my name is Runda Mahjoub. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present uh, the ISJEB uh, Journal Club. Uh, I'm presenting a case report, uh, uh, somatically derived uh, yolk sac tumor of the ovary in a young woman. Uh, uh, it, uh, it has been published last year in the International Journal of uh, Gynecologic Pathology, uh, written by Angelica Hodgson, uh, uh, Zena Gurab, and Carlos Parahiran, doctors. Uh, so, Basically, uh, uh, the case report uh, described a, a young woman uh, with an endometriosis-associated endometrioid adenocarcinoma that is demonstrating a yolk sac uh, tumor differentiation as well. In addition, uh, some of the literature has been reviewed. Uh, so, uh, so generally, we have the conventional uh, germ cell-derived yolk sac tumor which is a tumor arising from a, a malignant transformation of a primitive germ cell. And then we have uh, the notion of a somatically derived yolk sac tumor or germ cell tumor in general. Uh, those are infrequent, rare, and uh, basically the literature about them uh, um, available in, um, in case reports and small case series. And they basically describe uh, the presence of either a yolk sac tumor or a non-gestational choriocarcinoma arising presumably from a Mullerian adenocarcinoma that can be either a low grade or high grade. Uh, so uh, the age of germ cell derived yolk sac tumor is usually in the second and third decade of life. And the median age is about 19. While the majority of the somatically derived yolk sac tumor uh, arise in women more than 40 years old, and most of them are postmenopausal. Uh, so germ cell derived yolk sac tumor also uh, uh, happen, can happen in a context of other germ cell tumor, for example, immature ter teratoma or uh, dysgerminoma. Uh, but the majority, more than 6% of uh, germ cell derived yolk sac tumor are, uh, are usually pure. While the somatically derived yolk sac tumor can happen, as I said, uh, with a low grade or a high grade endometrioid carcinoma or other high grade serous or clear cell carcinoma. Regarding uh, the immunohistochemical profile, they pose express uh, the usual yolk sac marker, SAL4, glycan 3 and alpha fetoprotein. But in addition, the somatically derived yolk sac tumor usually uh, express uh, adenocarcinoma markers, for example, 
uh, CK7, EMA, and PRAB4. We know that York sac tumor can express pancytokeratin, but not CK7, while somatically derived York sac tumor can express CK7. Uh, regarding treatment and prognosis, um, the germ cell drives York sac tumor usually uh, are chemo responsive, and the treatment uh, usually uh, by surgery and uh, PAB, pleomycin, etiposidin, cisplatin, chemotherapy regimen. While the treatment of a somatically derived yolk sac tumor is rather controversial. Uh, some people advocate uh, a platinum-based chemotherapy plus or minus PAP regimen. And generally, a uh, yolk sac tumor in a, a postmenopausal women, um, whether they are germ cell-derived conventional, which is rare, or somatically derived yolk sac tumor, they are chemo resistant and has have good have uh, poor prognosis. Uh, so, uh, uh, general picture: this is a classic uh, Schiller Duval body, a characteristic of yolk sac tumor. Um, we have the yolk sac uh, uh, tumor here, pleomorphic uh, cells uh, surrounding uh, this vascular structure, and they are surrounded by a clear space. These are useful clues, and they are virtually diagnostic of yolk sac tumor in the, in the proper context. Again, um, here the yolk sac tumor uh, with a variable morphology, characteristic uh, stromal background, pseudoglandular species, and uh, pseudopapillary structures. And uh, in addition, we see those eosinophilic uh, uh, gl globules. Again, high power, uh, those xenophilic glo globules can be a clue to a yolk sac tumor. Uh, uh, in this case, we, we see both components. We see an epithelial malignancy, uh, which is a serous carcinoma, in addition to a yolk sac tumor. Uh, uh, this, case, uh, uh, this picture provided kindly by Dr. Benet uh, actually represents an endometrial case, not ovarian. Uh, so uh, regarding our case report, uh, uh, the paper reported a previously healthy 27-year-old female uh, presented to the emergency department with a two-week history of abdominal pain. Um, physical examination and imaging studies uh, revealed the right ovarian tumor with associated torsion. Serum markers revealed uh, elevated alpha fetoprotein and slightly increased CA125 levels. Other markers, including LDH, were normal. Uh, so other, res other result, a surgical consult was obtained and uh, a laparotomy was performed and the patient underwent a right salbingo of uh, Now, intraoperatively, um, the right ovary was replaced by a complex cyst, as we will see in the next gross picture. Uh, and the abdomen and pelvis and the other adenexa were free. Uh, on gross examination, uh, 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 so they sent the mass for an intraoperative pathology consultation, which is called frozen section. On gross examination, mostly cystic mass measuring 10 centimeter in maximum dimension. And they took uh, three, three sections. And the frozen section diagnosis rendered at that time was a malignant neoplasm favor yolk sac tumor. So as a result of that, uh, the patient underwent only omentectomy in addition to the right salbingo of rectum. Um, no hysterectomy was done or lymphadenectomy on the other adenexa was preserved. Uh, here we see the gross picture. We can see some ink here. This is a, a, a cyst wall thickened with some papillary projections. And here we see those dark hemorrhagic areas consistent with uh, endometriotic cyst. Uh, on microscopic evaluation of the permanent sections, actually 90% of the tumor was composed of conventional uh, yolk sac patterns, uh, microcystic, papillary, reticular, solid, endodermal sinus, and schiller duval bodies. 10% or less than 10% of the tumor was composed of a low-grade endometrioid morphology with typical squamous morural metaplasia. In addition, Areas of endometriosis were identified adjacent to the tumor within the fallopian tube serosa and on the omentum. Uh, here we see the microscopic picture. 
uh, the characteristic endometriotic cyst with the glands filled with blood and the spindle stroma and hemorrhagic as well. Here we see both components. Upper, we see the, endometri uh, the endometrioid carcinoma component and lower, we see the yolk sac tumor component. Here we see the intermediate magnification of the endometrioid component, typical glands uh, lined by pseudostratified columnar epithelia, demonstrating a squamous morial metaplasia in between. In addition, this area, the yolk sac area, uh, demonstrating the characteristic pseudoglandular spaces, uh, papillary structures, and Schiller Duval bodies in the yolk sac areas. So as a result, all immune histochemical stains were performed. Again, in this picture, upper, we see the endometrioid carcinoma, and lower, we see the yolk sac tumor component. Uh, the endometrioid carcinoma part is positive for ER, positive for PAX8, negative for sulfur, negative for glibicin 3 while the yolk sac component is negative for ER, negative for PAX8, positive for sulfur, and positive for glibicin 3 uh, Now, um, in addition to, the, to those four stains, uh, uh, other immune stains were performed. Uh, you can see that pancytokeratin is not that helpful because it is strongly diffusedly positive in both components, the oxac and the endometrioid. Uh, uh, we can see that uh, P16 and P53, P16 was patched in both component P53 wild type, excluding, for example, a serous carcinoma. Um, OCT4 was negative in both components, excluding, for example, embryonic carcinoma. Enapsin A was patchy in both components, um, excluding clear cell carcinoma. Uh, very helpful actually is EMA, which is a strongly diffusely positive in endometriotic carcinoma and patchy in yolk sac tumor. Uh, so other, other things in the differential diagnosis of this case, a collision tumor between an endometriotic carcinoma and yolk sac tumor. Uh, uh, but uh, th this possibility is, uh, is, uh, um, is not maintained because of the intimate association of the both morphologies. In addition, other differential diagnosis, endometrioid-like variant of a yolk sac tumor. But uh, this possibility is also unlikely because of the immunohistochemical profile. Uh, we have the EMA, posit EMA positivity, ER, and PAX8 positivity confirming endometrioid carcinoma, in addition to the presence of endometriosis and squamous morular metaplasia. So our case was staked as PT1C1 uh, due to intraoperative spillage. It was confined uh, to ovary, but there was an intraoperative spillage. And postoperatively, uh, the patient uh, was well, no complication, and serum markers returned to normal. Uh, so uh, multidisciplinary con uh, consultation and discussion was performed. And as a result, uh, the patient has been given only three cycles of uh, BAP regimen. Um, and 15 months later, uh, the patient was clinically and radiologically uh, stable. So uh, the case is unusual because of the young age of the patient. As we said, uh, most of the somatically derived yolk sac tumor happened in a postmenopausal women. And our patient is a 27 year old woman. Uh, there is a similar case report of a 28 year old woman who was later diagnosed with uh, Lynch syndrome. Uh, regarding the strengths and application of the study, uh, the case report highlight that uh, somatic, somatically derived yolk sac tumor can occur even in young patients. And uh, this possibility should be considered in uh, heterogeneous neoplasm in a young patient and uh, integration of morpholo morphology and application of immune histochemistry are recommended to arrive at this diagnosis. In addition, uh, the outlook seemed to be different uh, in young patients uh, compared to somatically derived yolk sac tumor that happened in older age women. Because this patient has been given only a BAP chemotherapy and, uh, uh, and the surgery was conservative and uh, 15 months later, she was doing well. Uh, areas of improvement, uh, I think more cases and longer follow-up of the current case um, are needed to determine uh, the, the exact prognosis 
and the effectiveness of the therapy provided. Also, uh, a comparison I think is needed between this tumor in young patients uh, versus this tumor, a uh, uh, somatically derived yolk sac tumor in postmenopausal women uh, to highlight the potential differences. For example, if the young age is possibly usually associated with a low grade uh, epithelial malignancy that give rise to a yolk sac tumor and whether um, this low grade epithelial malignancy what uh, gives a good prognosis uh, for those tumor in a young age as compared to the high grade epithelial malignancies in postmenopausal women somatically derived yolk sac tumor. Uh, in addition, I think molecular studies uh, may be helpful to understand the nature of this tumor, whether uh, they are uh, some sort of de-differentiation or a retro-differentiation of a somatic malignancy into a germ cell tumor, or whether they arise from a common um, stem cell-like precursor that give rise to epithelial and germ cell tumor. And with that, I thank you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Magoub. Nice um, uh, overview of this, I think, first case study we've actually looked at here. And we'll go into the reasons why we brought it up after we do the polling questions, possibly. All right, so you should see them on your screen now, populating. The first question deals with um, the explanation for the um, adenocarcinoma and yolk sac tumor components in this patient. And the second question um, talks about somatically derived yolk sac tumors and what is the most common setting at which these arise. So we'll give you a few seconds to work on those. Getting pretty good participation on these. So thank you for putting in your votes. Yes. I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, Dr. Benet, like I'll let you end, end it. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> there Perfect. you go. All right. Okay, so uh, what's the proposed explanation for adenocarcinoma and yolk sac tumor components in this patient? Um, and the correct answer, as you um, selected, was the yolk sac component represents aberrant differentiation of the adenocarcinoma. So this is an important um, point to make for these somatically derived yolk sac tumors, is that instead of arising from a, an ovarian germ cell precursor, like we think for the typical uh, tumors occurring in young patients, which are pure germ cells or mixed germ cell tumors, as we talked about in the last study. Um, the association with adenocarcinoma is thought to um, be that the yolk sac tumor actually rep represents sort of an aberrant primitive uh, differentiation event in that adenocarcinoma, so completely different tumor genetics uh, in these settings. And most of these tumors are described occurring uh, in question two here in postmenopausal women, um, and it's associated with a high-grade carcinoma. So this case is unusual, and the reason we're sharing it today is that it's arising in a young patient uh, where um, a patient young enough that uh, a typical yolk sac tumor might actually be in your differential. Uh, so if the, if the adenocarcinoma wasn't sampled, you know, it would be reasonable to think that this patient had only a yolk sac tumor. Uh, and it's also uh, the adenocarcinoma component in this case is low grade. Most of these tumors, when they occur in the usual setting, postmenopausal patients, high grade carcinoma, um, as uh, Dr. Magoob was stating, those patients uh, don't respond well to chemotherapy and typically don't do well. Um, we have some limited follow-up in this patient suggesting that she perhaps is doing better. And the question is uh, whether that's because of the association with the low-grade adenocarcinoma component. So maybe the, uh, the carcinoma is really what's driving prognosis. And it's only a case report and a limited follow-up, so hard to say for sure. But it raises some interesting questions, which is why we decided to discuss this case. Yes. 
And again, feel free to put in some questions if you've got them. We'll try to get those at the end. Um, but first, let's get to our last topic. So Dr. Shahid will be discussing ovarian intermediate trophoblastic tumors. So feel free to share your screen and take it away when you get a chance. Love the background, very peaceful. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am Rafiq Shahid, uh, PGY4 uh, from Brown University. Everybody can see my presentation and uh, Yep, that's me? great. Yep. Okay, so uh, again, thank you very much for participating and uh, taking your time. Uh, so today we'll discuss a paper from uh, uh, Dr. Dian Singh. Uh, the paper is Ovarian Intermediate Trophoblastic Tumors. Uh, genotyping defines a distinct category of and non-gestational tumors of germ cell type. So we'll just briefly discuss uh, uh, this paper. Uh, first, just I want to discuss uh, briefly background and refresh our mind about what are the intermediate uh, trophoblastic uh, tumors are. There are mainly two kinds, epithelial trophoblastic tumors and placental site trophoblastic tumors. Uh, the epithelial tumor, uh, trophoblastic tumors are malignant neoplasma chorionic type intermediate uh, trophoblast. They are well circumcised nodular, uh, nodular medium sized trophoblast. If we see on the right side the uh, HNE picture, we can see a very nice round monotonous uh, cell with uh, abundant eosinophilic uh, to clear cytoplasm, and they are uh, hyperchromatic and uh, some have prominent nucleoli, we can appreciate those. And they have background geographic necrosis, which are the uh, characteristic of this uh, tumor. Uh, the HNE uh, uh, and the immunostochemical stain is the most important is P63, which uh, is diffusely positive in these the tumors. And these tumors show uh, more than 10% of KI, uh, 67 proliferation, uh, proliferation index. And the placental site of glossy tumors are also malignant uh, uh, tumor uh, of um, like, uh, implantation site intermediate of blast. Uh, these tumors have infiltrative growth patterns. And on the right side in the HNE uh, picture, we can see large uh, polyhedral angulated uh, uh, implantation site tumor. They have abundant granular cytoplasm and they are. Uh, show a lot of uh, pleomorphism and hyperchromatic. The aminohistochemical stains uh, are these which are positive and they show about 10 to 30% 30, 30 uh, KI proliferation index. Now we'll go back to the introduction of our paper. Uh, Trophoblastic neoplasm involved the ovary are uncommon, including gestational tumors, uh, these tumors can be metastatic from uterus, ectopic, or non-gestational tumors, including germ cell type region and somatic tumor with uh, trophoblastic differentiation. In all these types, most are pure choriocarcinoma. The intermediate, uh, the intermediate trophoblastic tumors, as we discussed, there are two, uh, PSTT and ETT. The method the author used in this uh, uh, paper, they collected a total of six cases. These were from mostly author institute uh, from John, John Hopkins, five of them, and uh, one was from uh, China. The histological section of these cases were reviewed by uh, two pathologists to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, the markers they used in this study, all these were immunostry chemical markers which they used uh, to diagnose these uh, cases. Uh, the DNX uh, section was done on formalin fix uh, para embedded uh, tumor tissue and corresponding normal tissues identified by HNE staining of the adjacent uh, sections were micro dissected about 70% uh, of the section area. Molecular genotyping was done uh, in the New York Medical a laboratory. Uh, they use uh, uh, gene print 24 system, and the gene uh, print 24 system is a 
24 locus five color multiplex system designed to generate a multifocus human DNA profile from variety of human derived biological uh, sources. And they did, uh, uh, which allowed them to co, uh, co amplification and fluorescent detection of 24 autosomal short tendon uh, repeat locus. The results from this study were uh, three PS uh, TTs, the three, two ETDs, and one ETD with choriocarcinomatous uh, differentiation. So all these were uh, six, uh, six uh, cases, uh, ovarian intermediate trophoblastic division. So in this table, uh, just uh, all six cases are uh, results are shown, and the left side we can see the age of the patient ranging from 2.5 to 50, uh, 55 years old and a clinical presentation of the patients and beta HCG level and specimen collection. And in this uh, column, we can see tumor size and site. The tumor uh, size ranging from uh, three centimeter to 11.6 centimeter. And the diagnosis, interestingly, there are three of them were uh, PSTT and the three were ETT. Uh, all PSTTs were uh, caused co with mature cystic uh, teratoma. And one of those was uh, metastatic to the periotic lymph nodes. Uh, the origin, uh, if we see all PSTTs were non-gestational origin and one ETT was non-gestational origin and two ETT were gestational origin. This is a uh, h &E and immunosecondary staining uh, uh, diagram for, from the paper. This is uh, 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 PSTTs and from left to right, we see low magnification to high magnification. In the left uh, panel, we can appreciate the mature cystic teratoma. Here is a, a uh, squamous epithelium and their tumor cells uh, with hemorrhage and the middle panel we can appreciate the uh, blood vessel wall replaced by the tumor cells and there is a uh, in the tumor wall is replaced with the fibrinoid material on the uh, on the right high power we can appreciate the large uh, cell which uh, which are uh, mono to multinucleated, and they have abundantly cytoplasm. Uh, so H and E, they were positive, diffusely positive for HPL, and uh, patchy and focal positive for HCG and P63. And the genotyping, uh, if we see uh, the, on the top panel is the normal, and the middle is the PSTD and the mature teratoma. Uh, we can see if we're, I am not that. Uh, molecular pathologist, I can just look the pattern of the uh, allelic uh, spike in the, each loci, they look the same. There's no non-maternal uh, allelic spike. So this uh, was diagnosed and same in the cystic teratoma. So this was non-gestational uh, origin uh, PSTT. So the next diagram is uh, uh, h &E with the uh, immunosochemical stain is a uh, ETG tumor. The, from low power to high power. In the left side, we can see uh, geographic necrosis uh, with islands of hypercellular uh, tum uh, tumor in floating in the geographic necrosis. In the middle, we can appreciate the calcification and the right uh, at high magnification, we can appreciate uh, uh, monotonous uh, round cell with hyperchromatic uh, chromatin and some has prominent nucleoli. These are uh, diffusely positive for P63 and focally positive for HCG and PHPL. Uh, Again, the genotyping over here, if we can see normal uh, tissue with ETT, uh, we can see biparental uh, pattern, allelic pattern. We can see there is one spike, but over here we can see two in uh, amylogenin and in the normal tissue, we can see if there is a extra spike and over here. So this is uh, a non-maternal uh, 
spike in this. So this is by paternal and then this is uh, gestational origin ETD. And here is the hypothesized uh, uh, diagram of uh, uh, primary ovarian trophoblastic uh, tumor development. Uh, the author, they uh, put in this way, there is a ectopic uh, pregnancy, which could be a molar or non-polar or primary ovarian germ cell. They can give rise to gestational or non-gestational cytotrophoblasts, uh, which can give rise to uh, most primitive uh, Trophoblastic tumor, chorea carcinoma, which can uh, give spectrum of uh, change to the PSTTs or ATTs. And the other uh, hypothesis could be, and the cytotrophoblast uh, can differentiate into intermediate uh, impl implantation site uh, intermediate trophoblastic cells, and they can give rise to PSTT or uh, cytotrophoblastic can give rise to chorionic type intermediate. Uh, cells which can give rise to ETT. The discussion in this uh, paper, the author uh, described that the case series demonstrates rare set of uh, primary ovarian intermediate trophoblastic tumor. Uh, the non-gestational form of PSTT ETT uh, presumably arise from germ cell, uh, which we discussed in the previous uh, uh, figure number seven. The non-gestational tumor showed an extra ovarian spread. Uh, these tumors have potential to show aggressive behavior, but the data is very limited and we cannot predict from these six cases. The strength of study is in the study, they characterize a unique group of primary ovarian intermediate of blastic tumors and identify a non-gestational set consists of with germ cell type region include PSTT and ETT. The area of improvement uh, need, uh, it is very small and limited study to provide meaningful insights into the behavior and the prognosis of uh, these tumors. A large case uh, series is needed for uh, these uncommon intermediate of plastic uh, tumors in extra uterine sites with more extensive follow-up uh, would be desirable uh, to uh, discuss. So the, Application of this uh, study is uh, uh, meaningful. If we uh, do the genotyping studies can be helpful to differentiate gestational versus non-gestational intermediate uh, trophoblastic uh, uh, tumors. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. That was uh, my uh, overview on this uh, paper. Thank you, Dr. Shahid. So an unusual situation where we're seeing an intersection of intermediate trophoblastic tumors and the ovary site. So perfect for today's discussion. Um, and let's, uh, let's do our polling questions first, and then we can move on to uh, some of the Q&A. So it looks like we have a few questions in there. Yeah, do you mind uh, stopping to share, um, Dr. Shahid, so I can pull up the polling questions? Yeah. Awesome. And I'll start prepping you while Dr. Benet grabs the uh, the questions here. So our first question is um, going to deal with uh, the findings for the uh, genotyping in these tumors and what they found. Were all of the tumors gestational? Were they all non-gestational? Was there a mixture of the two? select your answer there. And in the second question, um, what neoplasm was found in association with all four placental site trophoblastic tumors? So asking for association there. And again, we'll give you a few uh, seconds to get those questions in. And we're already getting some responses. People are fast. I barely finished reading them. <laughs> <laughs> And while we get those questions in, again, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thank you for your participation and the polling questions and with the Q&A we'll get to at the end. And be sure to check out next month when we start doing our case presentations. That should be a great experience for trainees. Yes.
And next month's journal club topic is vulva. So there's a lot of good stuff going on in August. It's a lot to learn. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're going to end the polling. And okay. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. So for the first question, the whole point of this study was um, that in the um, WHO classification of intermediate germ cell tumors uh, occurring in the ovary, um, there was only a space for gestational tumors, thinking that they were either somehow um, met met metastatic from primary in the endometrium, or perhaps an involuted primary in the endometrium, or they were arising from ectopic tumors. And the whole point of the study was, was that the authors were illustrating that non-gestational intermediate trophoblastic tumors both PSTT and ETT can occur uh, primarily, it seems, in the ovary. And then the second question is, what neoplasm was found in association with all of the um, placental site trophoblastic tumors? Um, and that is uh, mature, so mature cystic teratoma was found in association with three of them, and uh, there was an epidermoid cyst in association with the other one. Um, I see a lot of people picked choriocarcinoma. There was one ETT. Um, that was called uh, an ETT with, with focal areas um, of choriocarcinoma. So there was that association in one tumor of the ETT category. And uh, the whole point of the mature cystic teratoma is it's, um, it provides maybe some evidence of a suggestion of where these non-gestational PSTTs um, arose from, uh, potentially arising from a teratoma. But that's purely speculative, given how mature cystic teratomas are very common. Uh, and at this, at this point, let's get to some of our, our questions. So we still have some time, so keep putting them in the bottom if you can uh, get there. And I'm going to go, I guess, from, they're sort of out of order now. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is the earliest question um, oh, yeah, regarding the malignant the mixed germ cell tumor question, uh, tumor paper. So asking if um, germ cell tumors arising from type 4 germ cell tumors is common at an older age. Did the paper have any older patients? So I think in the malignant mixed germ cell tumor paper, the oldest patient they had was 55. So they did have some paper, uh, some patients who were um, older than, you know, we typically think of these tumors occurring in young women, uh, second or third decade of life. So. Um, and they didn't specifically say that they excluded cases that had like a somatic malignancy, but one would assume, and because they mentioned other tumors that were mixed, right? But they don't right. say, so I think it's pretty safe to assume that these are all I, not I agree. the, yeah. There's another question that I unfortunately think I can't answer. It's asking about the um, germ cell hypothesis proposed by Dr. Francisco Nogales. So I know he's published a lot on germ cell tumors in general and asking if it's applicable to ovarian germ cell tumors. I'm not sure exactly which um, theory. I'm not um, familiar enough with Dr. Nogales. I know a few years ago he did um, write something about um, uh, somatic yolk sac tumor. So I'm not sure if that was the question, but if it is, then I think we answered it in our second study potentially. Yeah, that's that's kind of how I was reading that question, but I agree. He has written quite a few papers. So um, I agree. Um, awesome. Yeah. And then, okay, I think that was... Oh, there's one oh, more for that paper. The, um, yeah. Yeah. Identifying malignant... How do I identify um, malignant mixed germ cell tumors in mature cystic teratomas? So I think- And then I think she said, or the pathologist said grossly. Oh yeah, so, grossly, yeah. yeah. So I, I think the gross of mature cystic teratoma is very distinct actually. If you have a predominantly cystic tumor, again, that may or may not have the hair, you know, the teeth, those elements that we typically associate with mature cystic teratomas. If it's purely cystic like that, it's almost certainly going to be a mature cystic teratoma. If, there are, if the tumor is predominantly solid, those are the tumors where you expect to be an immature teratoma, and those are the settings in which you would expect a malignant mixed germ cell tumor to arise. So they're typically not associated, associated with mature cystic teratomas, um, but with immature teratomas. Um, if you see solid areas um, you know, in the wall of your mature cystic teratoma, maybe worth sampling those, but you're more likely to identify 
uh, another associated tumor, some struma, you know, maybe even a somatic malignancy in rare cases, but you're less likely to find um, a mixed germ cell tumor component. I think that several of the yolk sac tumors in that study that's were true, associated actually. with mature cystic teratoma. So that's the, that is actually the scenario that I have seen in actual practice, which is not surprising that that was like one of the most common. Um, yeah, and yeah. I can tell you that those mature cystic teratomas don't look like your everyday, you know, you open them and it's like this caseous hair and stuff that, sorry, there was like a solid component. And it's very interesting because even radiologists sometimes are suspicious that that's what's happening, right? Because sometimes they follow these patients or they see so many of them with the hair and the teeth and the bones. And so they know what they're looking at. And then they're like, and there's this other thing, you might want to check that out. So it is interesting. And I would say just um, sampling your specimen. And um, it's very interesting that the first paper was so morphologically driven, right? And then um, right. the second paper also touched on the fact that grossly, they noticed that endometriotic component, which kind of led them to support, it was like one other piece that supported that endometrioid component. So I think that gross is still so important, which I'm, I'm glad that someone asked that question. And when you're sampling at frozen and impermanence, like if you have multiple components and they look completely different from one another grossly, maybe throw in an extra frozen section just to see if you're dealing with something a little bit outside the norm, because it would have been easy to call, you know, that second case a yolk sac tumor if this this thing hadn't been thoroughly sampled. I hope that makes good sense. Good point. Yeah, yeah. So good, good. Um, and then, oh, okay. Um, this paper was that. Um, the the presenters, you're welcome to turn your camera on. I'll actually stop sharing so we can see all of your faces. Um, and you're welcome to take um, pl and part in the discussion. But there was um, one question about explaining the difference between collision tumor from somatically derived yolk sac tumor. Um, Dr. Magoob, did you want to take a Take a try at that, or you want to answer so, that? Yeah, ba yeah. Basically, that the that, you can turn uh, your camera on so we can see you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so uh, that was a consideration, but uh, I think the intimate association between the two components—you you can see them in, in the picture intermixed with each other—is not mm -hmm. a typical of a collision tumor. In a collision tumor, you can have a yolk sac separately from the endometrioid carcinoma. Right. Right, so they were just sort of both coexisting and sort of bumped yeah. into one another, whereas these were, you know, yeah, exactly. I think if yeah. they performed immune stains also, immune histochemical stains, if the, if the ox like uh, uh, take positive CK7 and uh, BEREP4, uh, that would support a, a somatically derived yolk sac tumor more than uh, a collision tumor that is uh, germ cell derived. Right. Yes. Right. I, I think yeah. the authors do address that in the study. They say, you know, that they considered the possibility of a collision tumor, but as you said, the components were so admixed together that they thought that was consistent with uh, a somatic uh, origin. But I guess without, you know, doing, Molecular, which would yes. be interesting yeah, to sequence both components, if you were able yes. to micro dissect them out, maybe you could prove it. But I'm sure um, someone somewhere is doing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Since this is such a hot topic, I'm sure someone's doing it. So, yeah. Um, let's see. And then, wasn't there a question about the final article as well? About there's a few more. I see one uh, talking about that case of um, epithelioid trophoblastic tumor with choriocarcinomatous differentiation, because um, they bring up the point that you can have choriocarcinomas that are rich in intermediate trophoblasts, which is true. Um, right. I, I think the authors mentioned that, and they say that the areas were sort of separate. The choreo component was small, and the vast majority of it was really classic morphology uh, and staining, in their opinion, for an ETT. Um, you know, I, I, it sounds like that is a very unusual case in general. So um, the only other thing I can say in support of, of, of what they said was that um, Dr. Ronette was on the paper and she's sort of <laughs> one of the gurus of, of yeah, between her and tumors, so saying, I think I they can figure it out. But it does, it, it sounds like it looked like a classic ETT from their description and that there yeah. were areas that were really rich in those syncytiotrophoblastic giant cells, which you don't usually see in ETT. And also the patient's HCG was way more elevated than you normally see in ETT. Usually they're like much lower mm -hmm. than like a choriocarcinoma. So um, yeah, very unusual, but that's a really good point, especially um, you know, that you can, sometimes these things, the lines between them do blur a little bit and it's it's confusing. That's why I think um, Dr. Shahid did a good job just laying out the groundwork at the beginning because if you don't run into these tumors a lot, they're pretty rare, so. 
Oh, yeah. I, I see that Dr. Oliva is on, and she mentioned in regard to that first question with Dr. Nogales, oh. uh, it's a theory that he brought up with six types of germ cell tumor origin, and she okay. gave the reference there. So oh. anyone, yeah, Oster Ruiz and Nogales. So thank you, Dr. Oliva. I'll People can go that, check that I'll out. I'll find the abstract in the paper. I'll stick it on the website with the journal. Thank you so much. That would be awesome. Yeah, um, that's great. So um, thank you to all our presenters. Do you all have any final comments or anything you'd like to say? Yeah, thank you so much. That was a good opportunity, and uh, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Vianney and Dr. Maxwell and uh, all the presenter. And uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, awesome, and uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Great, great. Okay, thank you all for being here, and thank you to all the audience. And um, everyone, have a lovely day. Thank Thanks you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.